because gravity is operating on us all the time, it, we are able to, to not only detect translational movement, translational acceleration, but also static head tilt. That means that I, my, I'm getting a vestibular system, vestibular message that my head is tilted. And the way that happens is on the, uh, it, it affects the utriculus, um, it also affects the sacculus, but it, so as we look at here, uh, if the utriculus is tilted because you're no longer on horizontal, that displaces the otoconial mass, and there's a, there's a response to this. But if you, but the response is absolutely the same as as though one were not tilted and moving uh, in this direction, whichever direction this is. So let's say this is forward. If we move forward, the otoconial mass is is uh, displaced backwards. And if I tilt my head backwards, the otoconial mass is also tilted backwards. Okay, so that's one problem. That is one problem with the, particularly with the utriculus and sacculus uh, messages is that they're not, they're not unambiguous. They are ambiguous. And, and this is pretty easily solved because we can get uh, information from multiple uh, uh, um, vestibular end organs. But in addition, there's one other thing that gets added uh, that is a big player in, in interpreting vestibular uh, signals. And if we go over to the board, what we've seen so far is that, let's say that there's information coming in from a canal, and it comes into the central nervous system, and it, it uh, synapses on a vestibular nucleus neuron. Well, it turns out that the other, another major input that this neuron gets comes from the midbrain, and it carries information about what's called optic flow. Now, optic flow is, is information about the visual scene, but it is not what color it is, it's not what form it is, it's not, um, you can't tell very much about it. But what you can tell is where the entire visual field is it staying the same or is it moving? If I'm on a train, my optic flow is going, I see the world passing this way. I'm looking ahead, the world is passing. So I can see optic flow. There is an optic flow. If I'm just standing here, if I stand perfectly still, no optic flow. Or if there's uh, um, something blowing across that can also produce it. So. But the important point is that this vestibular neuron cannot tell the difference between these two inputs. And what this uh, input from the vestibular system only operates above about one hertz, maybe above, a little, maybe above two hertz. But below, certainly below one hertz, there's no information coming from here because the acceleration is too small too low magnitude to actually excite the hair cells. So for very slow accelerations, we use optic flow instead. And this vestibular neuron has no clue. It takes these two inputs and mixes them, integrates them. It has no idea what came from optic flow and what came from the uh, vestibulum. And this is why when you're sitting on a train that is either stopped or slowly moving, and there's a train on the other track that is either slowly moving or stopped, you can't tell which is which until, there's, until one of them speeds up. So if I'm sitting here and that one starts to move, it's just moving slowly, I don't know if I'm moving or if they're moving. That's due to this convergence of optic flow and, um, and vestibular information. The, the fact that we cannot tell, distinguish between these two di different inputs tells you that vision is very important. It can trump uh, what we're getting from the vestibular system. So the vestibular system may not be giving us anything. The vestibular apparatus may not be giving us anything if we see the optic flow.
um, we can we can figure out how our head is moving in space. Now imagine that you have that there is none of this. The optic flow is cut off. Let's imagine that that's the case. Now, what do you have? You have vestibular information, and you have one other input, which is proprioceptive in input. So, in other words, you can tell if your if your neck is upright, or you can tell if your neck is back. All right. So you can tell information about how you're holding your head. Um, and so, if you lose the optic flow, you can use this. But it but these two. Combined, don't do a perfect job. And the place where this becomes obvious is in um, spatial disorientation. Spatial disorientation isn't that, um, isn't that common, but it can be lethal in one particular circumstance. And that is in uh, a pilot who is piloting an airplane uh, and there, is no, there are no visual signals. So if they're in fog and they cannot detect any visual cues, they have to get it from their instruments. It's very hard for them to get any information from themselves. So that so they're 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 rely they have to rely on the instruments. They have to trust the instruments over their own perceptions. Very hard to do, and this um, does uh, unfortunately result in in um, in fatalities. All right, now. There's, uh, there's another input into here. And the way we can understand that input is to think about uh, motion sickness. OK, so why does motion sickness occur? Motion sickness occurs when we are not propelling ourselves, when we are propelled in, let's say, a, a modern vehicle, a car, a, a bus, um, in, for some people, in a plane. In that situation, you're moving, but you have no, you have nothing to do with it. That is a very odd situation, evolutionary speaking. Past the point of babyhood, when when our mothers typically carry us as mammals, uh, the um, we don't, we are not propelled without us propelling ourselves, and so consequently. Um, when we do propel ourselves, we send a message to the vestibular nucleus to tell the, the, the vestibular nucleus to ignore expected uh, movements of the head. So for example, if I decide I'm going to turn my head to the right, as I turn my head to the right, I'm also sending a signal to the vestibular nucleus to, to ignore that rightward uh, yaw uh, rotation. So that's suppressed. But now let's just say that I'm in a car and I and I am turned because there's a turn and the, the car is turning. Um, I have no way to negate that. So now I see that uh, and now I get this vestibular input uh, from a motion that I that I didn't make, but that was made by the car. And this mismatch between the uh, expected uh, the expected vestibular output from the vestibular nucleus um, and uh, and what actually does occur this mismatch only occurs when the there is no motor signal to say turn off that signal turn off that signal and so it, you get this mismatch between what you perceive from the vestibular system and what you perceive from the visual system and what you expect from the motor system and so on. And this mismatch, again, takes you into toxin detector uh, uh, land where you, the, a sensory mismatch is interpreted as something's wrong in my blood. I better throw up. I must have eaten something bad. It was, um, a, co it was a very common problem for astronauts uh, at the start. They would go up into space. They would start to uh, twirl around. They would not get the expected sensory uh, feedback from that twirl because they're, in, in, they're out in space where, where the otoconial masses are floating off wherever they are floating off. And, um, and they start to vomit a lot. So NASA uh, funded a lot of this research, and we understand now a lot about how this works. So the treatment for, for motion sickness is um, 
is often scopolamine, which is going to simply uh, reduce secretions into the um, gastrointestinal tract um, and block um, block uh, the nausea and vomiting in that way, or at least the vomiting. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to switch and look at the motor consequences of vestibular stimulation. Mm-hmm.